There's a story I would like to read in my book of his sayings called Conversations with Yogananda. It is saying number 199. A wealthy man, this is quoting Master, a wealthy man came here to Mount Washington and stayed for a time. Our work at that time was in dire financial straits, and he might easily have saved the situation for us but he wanted concessions from me that, on my conscience, I would not make, for they were unprincipled. He left, and when he did so, he said to me, You'll starve because you didn't listen. To him, listen, meant my consent to his disgraceful proposal. Well, we survived. God alone always is our stocks and bonds. In fact, one time somebody said to him very superciliously in the early years there, what are the assets of this organization? And Master said, none, only God. And that's how he lived. You know, many years ago, I was here in India. This was, I came here in 58. And in 59, I was lecturing in India, and I mean in Delhi. And many people came. I had thousands of people. And I felt that here is where I can really serve my guru because people want what I had to have to give. And so I decided to do something here, but everybody told me it's just out of the question. Everything is decided by the government. You can't get land, uh, private land here, uh, for, uh, hospitals, industries, all sorts of things, schools, universities, everything else has priorities. Even private homes have priority over ashrams because uh, people thought at that time, Nehru himself thought, that uh, um, uh, we, uh, India it has a surfeit of ashrams. I didn't know what to do. I went out to the outskirts of Delhi, which at that time was Kutub Minar, and people showed me all those fields and meadows and just empty land, and they said, across the horizon is a little village called Gurgaon. And... Uh, I thought, well, this is much too far. Nobody, very few people had cars in those days. Most people had to go by bus and to come all the way even to the outskirts of the city meant quite a bit of walking if we got anything beyond that. So I didn't know what to do. And I finally, I said, I said, by my will, I will make it happen. And I determined that I would get land in the Greenbelt area. And since I couldn't get land in the Greenbelt area anyway, I decided to get land near Birla Mandir. Birla Mandir, of course, is fairly close to the center of the city. The green belt sort of makes a curve in there. And I decided I wanted 25 acres. Well, everybody said I was an absolute uh, madman to have such a thought. And I remember Mr. Ratti, who was the finance minister for Delhi State, was the man who told me that it was just laughably impossible. Well, um, Finally, I reached the point where Nehru himself, I was able to meet him, and he agreed to my proposal. My organization was so outraged that I would take such chances. They thought that, um, first of all, I was crazy, and secondly, I, they could never control me, and so they threw me out. It was really the greatest blessing that happened to me ever, because it freed me to serve my guru in the way that he had told me I should do. Well, anyway, during that period, across Mandir Lane, where I wanted the land, many of you know that, across from that there was, and perhaps still is, a yoga ashram. And a wealthy man said to me, I have looked at the bylaws of that ashram, Swamiji, and I can get it for you. I will just, its bylaws say that a majority of people determine who runs it. And I will simply buy up enough memberships and then give the ashram to you and you can have it. I said, I will never take it on such unscrupulous terms. I don't want it. He couldn't believe. He was a real banya, uh, uh, merchant plus, you might say. And so he couldn't believe that I would re reject such an offer. So he bought up these memberships, and one day he came to me and told me, Swamiji, the ashram is yours. I said, I don't want it. I told you I don't want it. Take it away. I want nothing to do with it. It was an unprincipled thing. Here other people were running it perfectly happily, and he was going to get them thrown out and me put in charge. I wouldn't dream of taking it in those, on those terms. 
Well, this is the sort of abiding by the truth that my guru told me, that we must always follow what is principled, even though it looks as if this shortcut will give us what we want. Like that man had lots of money, he could have done all sorts of things, but it wasn't the right principle. Like this man, it wasn't the right principle. If I was to get it, I wanted to get it honestly and not hurt anyone. Many people are willing to hurt others. They will lose. I have suffered enough in past lives to know that they will lose. I, I must have experienced this many times because not only did my guru teach me this, and I sort of took down notes, and well, I guess, no, I just felt it inwardly. But other people suffer because of you. You suffer in the end yourself. And so anything that you do, Remember the words, the Sanskrit slogan. I first saw it on the uh, palace of the Maharaja of Kutpehar. Jata dharma tata jaya, which in Sanskrit is yata dharma tata jaya. Where there is dharma, there is victory. And in your work, people have said to me, well, how can I succeed in business if I don't sometimes you know, cut the corners a little bit, tell a few untruths, well, yes, you may get away with it once, you may get away with it a hundred times, but sooner or later, things will begin to turn against you. If you don't tell the truth, the truth won't support you. But if you stick by the truth, no matter what, people may treat you badly. People certainly have tried to treat me badly. I speak from experience. The very people who threw me out did their best later on to destroy me. But I always believe that if I stick by truth as I understand it, I'm not going to play this game of manipulation and um, trying to get even with them by revenge or anything. Why? If you live by truth, God himself will help you. And when I was thrown out, I had nothing. I had a well-to-do father, yes. But he never gave a dime to this work because he didn't believe in it. He thought I was crazy to become a yogi in the first place. He never helped me and never gave a, well, never gave up paisa, I could say. And yet I found that by doing what I had to do, doing it in the right way, doing it in a way that would not hurt anybody, finally things began to go my way. And you know it's a strange thing, but to succeed in life you need people to follow you, usually, certainly for the kind of work that I do. But to get people to follow you, you have to be a success already. It was just one of those catch-22s, as we say in America. It was a dilemma around which I did not know how to work, but I said it doesn't matter. I will abide by what uh, I believe. And people would say, well, you'll fail. You're bound to fail. Nobody's ever succeeded. I wanted to start a community that said people have started communities forever. None of them have succeeded. I said, it doesn't matter if I fail or succeed. I don't care. Yes, of course I care, but I'm willing to accept failure rather than do something wrong. I know that even in trying, God will give me some blessing. And it has turned out that out of thousands of communities that were started back in the 60s, just about alone, Ananda has succeeded. And gloriously, too, we're famous through the world now. We have seven communities, about a thousand people live in them, and I want very much to start communities here in India. I want people to understand that if they live with others who are also devotees, as it says in the Shastras, satsang is the most important thing of all. When you can mix with others who have spiritual beliefs also, then that helps to give you strength to go on.